this is going to be a tutorial on maximum bipartite meshing, uh, which is an important algorithm that came up during the CoJam contest today. Uh, so the idea is we have some vertices on the left, we have some vertices on the right, we have some edges in between, and we want to pick uh, the biggest number of edges that we can, uh, such that each vertex is only on one edge. Um, so for example, this is not allowed because this vertex has two edges, but this would be allowed. Um, and this is actually maximum matching here. The best answer we can get is two. And you can see that because this guy doesn't have any edges coming off of him. So in most, these two can participate in the matching. Um, so that's the idea of maximum bipartite matching. How do we actually do it? Um, so the algorithm that we're going to be looking at uh, sees as follows. So this guy, we just try to match him with one of his neighbors, like this one. That works out. This guy doesn't have any uh, existing match conflict, so good. Okay, now we can move on to this guy. So we try matching him with uh, his neighbor. This guy's already matched, but we don't give up. We say, okay, well, can this guy, right, the existing partner, maybe he can match with someone else. So we go back to him, and the answer is yes, he can. He can match with this guy. Uh, so we delete. Right? We had this match. We delete it, and then we put in this match and this match. Uh, this is called an augmenting path, right? Because we sort of went here, here, here. And we had to delete one edge, but we got to add two edges. So net were plus one edge. Um, so you know that's a benefit. So now we match these two. OK, and now we can try and match this guy. So can this guy match his neighbor? Well, let's see. We can try matching here. Uh, then we would have to unmatch this edge. And can this guy match somewhere else? Well, maybe he can match here. Then we have to unmatch this edge. And can this guy match somewhere else? Well, no, he can't. Uh, so this thing does not work. Um, and so this guy cannot be matched. So we're stuck with this as the maximum matching, and indeed that's two, uh, which is what we said earlier was the best. It's not the same matching we had earlier, right? It actually has neither of the same edges before we had this, and now we have this, but it's the same size, and that's good enough. Uh, okay, so that's sort of the idea. Um, let's look at the code for this now. Um, so we're given the list of edges, uh, which maps from the left side to some vertices on the right side. And we also want to know how many, how many vertices are on the right side. Uh, it doesn't need to be the same number, right? In this example, we had the same number on the left and the right, but in general, it could be you know, as many as you want on either side. Um, and so we're going to return uh, the list of you know, which edges matched, basically. So a vertex on the left and a vertex on the right. Um, so the way, what we're going to do is keep track of for each vertex on the right, which guy on the left isn't matched with. Initially, they're not matched at all. So that's what negative one is going to indicate. Um, and then we're going to try and match each vertex uh, on the left, um, try to find an augmenting path for it. So we might change, our, right, this is our like sort of current match. We might change our mind as we're adding another vertex. Um, but if we succeed, we'll end up with one more edge uh, than we started with. Um, so we'll look at this function uh, in a sec. That does basically a DFS to find an augmenting path. Um, and if it succeeds, it should find one more edge, right? So um, like the number of non-negative entries in match R should be equal to this answer. And that's what we're going to check at the end. Um, so match R has the match, right? So for each vertex on the right, if it actually matched with something, you know, write that down, uh, check the number of matches we got is what we expected, and then return the actual matches. Um, OK, so let's look at that uh, augmenting path finder. Um, so we have the edges in the graph, the number of vertices on the right, the uh, vertex that we want to match. Um, this is going to be which vertices on the right we've already tried. And this is the current match, which we might edit during this function. Right? So you know, the edges we're not going to edit. That's why they're cons. But the match we might edit. And of course, we're going to say that we've seen more stuff on the right. Um, so for each edge on the right, corresponding to this edge on the left, right? for each of the things that it might match with, if we haven't tried uh, matching with this um, this vertex on the right already, and by the way, notice that the scene vector resets for each vertex on the left. Um, this is why it's going to end up being an n-squared algorithm, or nm really, because it could be different numbers on the left and the right. Um, OK, so if we haven't tried this vertex already, try it. So I'll mark down that we're going to try it. Um, if it's not much with, matched with anything, like great, we're done, because we can just immediately match it. Um, so write down that we made a match and return true. Uh, otherwise, it's, it is already matched with something, but we still might be able to make it work if we can find another partner for that guy. Um, so recursively call this function. 
and pass in the old partner of j. Um, notice that we're using the same scene vector, uh, which is the key to making this run fast. Um, and the idea is uh, if we've already tried making a path from a vertex, uh, it's not going to get any easier later, right? The only thing that's happening is we're adding more things to scene, which makes it harder to find um, find a path to a free node. Um, so yeah, that's why we're using the same scene array for the recursive calls um, and pass in the match, right? So this might edit, you know, this is going to look basically until it eventually finds a free vertex, uh, sort of going through these paths. Um, and it might edit the match and it will, you know, check, see some more stuff. So if it does succeed in finding a match, then we can mark that um, J matches with I now. Uh, and if we did this recursive call, we modified match R to, you know, match up some other stuff, that's fine. Um, and return true to show that we found a match. And if we go through all the neighbors and we can't find a match, then uh, false, right? no match. Um, so that is it. Uh, as I mentioned, it's this is an N squared algorithm. Um, here's n, and this is another factor of n because uh, basically every time through this uh, function we you know add to the scene array, right? Everything turns from scene equals false to scene equals true, um, and so we can only do uh, O of m work, right? The number of vertices on the right side um, in all of these recursive calls. Uh, so yeah, that's the maxim by potent matching. Um, now, let me show how it applies to the cogen problem from today. Um, so, uh, probably easier to look at the analysis. No, they don't have any pictures. Um, so, we had this grid of tiles, and we wanted to turn it into some other grid, right? In this case, this is the start and this is the target. Um, and we can either swap to adjacent tiles, or we can flip the tile. Um, and so, you can think of this as a bipartite matching problem. Um, to do the swaps, basically. Uh, right. In the first test set, um, the swaps and the flips uh, both cost one. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the second test set in this video. Uh, right. So in this case, and so the point is, um, a flip always fixes one tile, and a swap can fix two tiles. So uh, you want to do as many swaps as possible that actually fix two tiles, because they're half as expensive as the flips. Um, and so this question really boils down to, how many swaps can you do that don't interfere with each other? Um, right, like this G can't swap with both of these M's, uh, even though it would, right, like this swap here would fix two tiles, but it would actually mess up this swap. So we don't want to do, and this swap, so we don't want to do it. Um, we actually want to do this swap and this swap, uh, which you can see is what they did. Right, first they swap this, then they swap this, and then you flip this to finish it off because it doesn't have anything to swap with, because uh, it's the only one that's still wrong. Um, Right, so what you do is uh, you can think of the tiles, right, the vertices on the left as the green tiles, and the vertices on the right as the M tiles that are wrong. Um, and then you draw an edge uh, with two things that can swap with each other. Um, and then you find the maximum by prototype matching. That tells you how many uh, sort of swaps that don't interfere with each other you can do. Um, and then the answer is just. Uh, Right, you do those swaps, each of those fixes two, and then you need to flip the other one. So you have the number of swaps is the max, is obviously the number of swaps you can do, and then the number of flips is uh, the number of bad tiles minus twice the number of swaps, and that's the answer. Um, right, so what we're doing is we're going through the grid. Uh, if it's a green tile and also it's bad, it needs to be changed, then look up, down, left, and right. Um, if, uh, let's see. So if this tile needs to be changed and also the new tile is in bounds and also the new tile needs to be changed and also the new tile is the other color, which is M, uh, then write down, you know, add an edge to a ref. Um, right, so I've just made a 100 by 100, you know, 100 here, vertices on the left, 100 vertices on the right to deal with the, um, the grid is 10 by 10, potentially. Um, so we pass this, uh, you know, 100 by 100 graph into our bipartite matching function. It tells us how many swaps we get, um, and that lets us solve uh, test case one. Um, 
so that is all on maximum biprotide matchings.